Good morning, everyone. I'm Ann Brain. I'm one of the second year general cardiology fellows. And today I'll be presenting a unique case of constrictive pericarditis and then sort of briefly talking about it um, towards the end. So let's get started. Uh, we'll just dive in. This is a 46 year old female who's present, who presented initially in June of 2019 with shortness of breath and chest discomfort. This was to an outside facility. She undergoes, um, so the initial evaluation shows a large pericardial effusion. She undergoes pericardial synthesis, so the effusion, 800 cc's of hemorrhagic fluid is removed. She's not on any blood thinners um, and no history of trauma. Analysis was, un was unremarkable at the time and the cytology was negative. She does well through her short hospital stay and discharge on colchicine for six months uh, with plans to follow up in about three months. So briefly about her, her prior history is significant only for hysterectomy for fibroids and uh, hysterectomy of shingles reactivation. Uh, otherwise, she's heavily inactive. She has an office job and she lives independently. Uh, no prior cardiac history, no significant, significant viral infections, no significant travel history. At this time, the diagnosis was presumed maybe viral myocarditis versus there was some concern that the, um, uh, with the shingles that might be related. But there was nothing solidified and the plan was to follow her. But before her three-month follow-up, she comes back in again. Uh, this is one month from her original discharge time and uh, with recurrent pericardial effusion. So similar symptoms under the echocardiogram shows another large pericardial effusion. She undergoes creation of a pericardial window at this time. Um, the pericardial biopsy from uh, the window shows mesothelial lined fibrous tissue with chronic inflammation, and that's negative for malignancy. Again, she's discharged on colchicine and prednisone this time, and the plan is to sort of taper it slowly. She's seen in a uh, follow-up about three months later, and everything's going well. In about six months, they slowly taper out the medications, and she does well. Um, again, the diagnosis is a little unclear as to why she had this, but she was doing okay, and so the, so the plan was made to just follow up. Um, and then sort of 20, 21 months pass, and she comes to us. Before this, she goes back to her outside uh, physician with recurrence of symptoms for the prior two months, two to three months, um, and sort of he evaluates her and then refers her here to her uh, clinic, the pericardial clinic. And she comes in. She's very short of breath. She's very evidently volume overloaded and has some chest discomfort. Um, and based on her exam, her history, and her discomfort, she's admitted directly from clinic for diuresis and further assessment. So just to get, when she arrives to the hospital, she, uh, her blood pressure is 140.98 and heart rate's 95, so not very tachycardic. She's maintaining SAS reasonably on room air. She's comfortable in sitting up position, but she's unable to recline because it's just the discomfort she has uh, with shortness of breath. The physical exam is remarkable, uh, very, very remarkable for volume overload, elevated JVT, abdominal distension, significant lower extremity edema bilaterally, and just the overall sense of discomfort uh, in her. She starts undergoing diuresis, um, and then we start with some um, diag uh, diagnostics. So this is her EKG. Basically, the rate's just uh, under 100 in sinus. Um, nothing too remarkable here, maybe some T-wave inversions, but other than that, um, nothing too dramatic. And then she has this chest X-ray on admission. Um, and here, there's significant cardiomegaly, and the cardiac silhouette is somewhat globular. Um, but you also have a very large left-sided effusion. It's hard to say on that side. Um, and then you see that uh, there's vascular congestion as well. So a lot of volume overload, big effusion, and then the cardiac or the mediastinal silhouette is a little enlarged. So we go into her echocardiogram, and on the left is the peristone long axis. Um, and the first thing, so sort of going systematically, the chamber size grossly looks normal, and there's the function also looks preserved uh, with the mitral valve, uh, which we can see looks normal and collapsing normally. But the big thing that you see here is this echo-dense um, surrounding structure just outside the myocardium, somewhat nodular or irregular um, around the RVOT and also around the LV um, and some fluid potentially in the pericardial space. Hard to say just in this view, but sort of clearly there. And then you sort of move to the right onto the short axis and the same thing. Um, the chamber size and chamber functions look uh, adequate, but around the heart is basically what you see, this echo-dense irregular structure 
Um, and then here, the other thing that sort of jumps out at me is the septal motion, it's sort of what we call a septal bounce or restrictive uh, septal motion, where it sort of goes towards uh, the LV and then sort of bounces back towards the RV in different phases at the end of feet. Um, sort of moving on. So we have an apical four chamber view on the left here. And again, um, the same thing, the chamber size seems adequate. However, there's this nodular echodense structure around the heart, um, so they're very prominent, and, um, and then some fluid in the pericardial space there. Um, and sorry about, um, and then on the right, I, I, I don't know if there's something coming up on the screen here. Just give me one second, there we go. Um, and on the right, we have a subcostal view. Um, and again, the same thing, so I just won't belabor it. But basically what we see is we see the structure in, on uh, all the views. And sort of going into a little bit of flow here. Um, so, so on the left, we have the tricuspid inflow. And then on the right, we have the mitral inflow. And, and basically, we see significant variation. Even on the tricuspid side, um, you see a little bit, but I'll talk about the mitral first, that with inspiration, you have a decrease. Um, and then with expiration, you sort of see an increase. And, and that's sort of this variation of flow across the mitral valve with, with regards to um, respiration. And on the tricuspid as well, although it's the opposite and it's not as pronounced there, but you see that. And then Going into the Doppler, so sort of on the left we have the septal tissue Doppler and, and the lateral tissue Doppler. And the E prime on the lateral is also slight, uh, slightly lower, but it's lower than the septal tissue Doppler, which is reversal um, and sort of evident, evidencing annulus reverses. And then lastly, we have the IVC, so a dilated plump IVC, about 2.5 centimeters here, and doesn't sort of collapse with the sniff test. And there's reversal of hepatic vein flow. Um, and uh, with with the sort of expiration, increased reversal. And then she also had the small sign where there was increased JVD with inspiration. So sort of everything sort of pointing towards a preliminary diagnosis of constrictive pericarditis. And just sort of the same things here, just normal LVRV with large effusion and then echodense mass around the heart, a dilated IVC, septal bounce with septal shift and resp respiratory variation of mitral and tricuspid inflow. So um, before this and before I let it play, um, so we go ahead and get a couple of imaging uh, studies sort of uh, in quick succession. So I'll start with the CT here, sort of get a sense. And so basically, that's uh, what we see here. We see this heterogeneous almost sort of mass around the heart um, encasing from the great vessels all the way down to, to the apex uh, and all around it circumferentially. And it's got some nodular um, uh, areas. And then there's a, around the right atrium, there's an area which seems like a loculated pleural effusion. Um, so, and we check the Hansfield units on this, and it's just about 50. So it's some sort of a soft tissue that's not fat. Um, but that was pretty much what we got from this. Um, and then sort of moving on, we go towards the, the cardiac MRI. So this is just sort of a, a quick sort of stacked image to show the the extent uh, of the tumor really that it starts from it encasing the aorta, the main pulmonary artery, the left and right pulmonary artery, the IVC, sorry, the SVC, and then all the way up around the heart and then to the very end, just encasing it all over. And you see fluid there. So we just put it. So this is the um, Cine SSFC sequence, and you see this heart sort of trapped here, um, and hence the name heart and cage, so it's trapped here with that pretty significant sets of bounce and sets of shift, uh, but also the fusion around the right atrium is just dispirited, and then um, the circumferential mass with heterogeneous sort of uh, appearance here on the MRI, sort of mixed elements there a little bit, and a large sort of right, uh, left-sided effusion. And so this is a free breathing sequence here, so there's no uh, patient breathing throughout the cycle, and basically we see an increase of the septal shift with uh, respiration. Sort of the same thing, you see that this heart is sort of encased by this mass and there's 
pretty significant constrictive uh, physiology secondary to that. And then we use the MRI sort of to give us clues about um, what this could be and so just talk a little bit about it. So in the axial, we just know that this is a, this is from the same uh, the clip I showed and this is, we know that this is in heterogeneous mass um, with, with sort of a little bit of fluid and, and um, um, perhaps a little bit of other elements, but predominantly soft tissue. And then this is black blood sequence. Um, and basically see whether there's any blood in, in the mass or, or blood around. And you don't really see the blood goes all black, but you don't really see anything in that pericardial space. This is a T2 stir sequence, um, and basically looking for a demo, or, and you do see that you see the myocardium a little bit dark there, and then beyond that, quite a lot of edema and, the, and inflammation in that space around the heart. And then lastly, the lo late gadolinum enhancement. Here was a little bit of a surprising element, which is all the um, sort of highly metabolic or vascular tumors will have significant uptake of gadolinum contrast, but here you actually don't see it. You see a little bit in the periphery in the pericardium, um, but not a whole lot within the within the mass itself. Um, so sort of narrowing down our um, diagnoses to a couple of tumors, like lymphoma being the first one, and then epithelioid tumors um, um, sort of being being up there with it. So, and this is basically everything I talked about. So just sort of this was the final read on it, sort of talking about the IVC, the effusion, um, and the extent of uh, the the mass with the significant constrictor physiology. And the one thing that we did uh, did not find was any infiltrative process in the myocardium. So you don't see a lot of late enhancement within the myocardium as well. Um, so at this time, we did, thought that it was all um, in the pericardial space. So we go ahead and get a PET scan, a whole body PET. We just want to show this. Right, so, so it lights up like the sun and such a remarkable scan here. Um, so the entire uh, sort of body of the mass just lights up. Um, and she doesn't have a lot of lymph nodes uh, that light up in the mediastinum chest or anywhere else, uh, which were picked up earlier on the scans. But this entire sort of mass lights up and I just thought this was a very remarkable um, imaging study here. So after this, we sort of speak to the surgical team, the oncology team and the census and we need to know what this is. Um, and to sort of go for uh, mass biopsy. We speak to uh, IR and they said they can attempt an anti-mediastinal CD-guided biopsy of the mass, and so we go for that. And uh, um, before I actually give you the read, I'm gonna invite Dr. Amukapade um, to sort of speak about the histopathology a little bit here. Thank you, uh, Amreen. Can you hear me? Is it a is it yeah, yeah, Dr. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Okay, thank you. So this is the a picture of the biopsy, and um, you can see that it's sort of a, a needle biopsy, and this is from the anterior mediastinal slash pericardial mass. Um, the black arrows are actually pointing to neoplastic cells. So there are tumor cells here. Uh, they have an infiltrative and very complex growth pattern. In fact, at the lower right, there are little papillary finger-like formations that support a neoplastic interpretation. The red arrow points to the stroma and the stroma is actually showing a desmoplastic response, which means that it's reacting to the infiltrating tumor. Next, please. So this is a high magnification of the same thing. The lower black arrow actually points to one of these papillary structures that supports a malignant interpretation. And the reason I'm mentioning this is that the most difficult part of the interpretation is actually to prove that this is malignant, the type of tumor cells is actually easier to, to show by immunohistochemistry. Again, the red arrow points to the stroma. Next, please. Now, what exactly are these infiltrating cells? Here's where immunohistochemistry is very helpful because we have markers, immunohistochemical markers for mesothelial cells and non-mesothelial malignancies. You know, the highest on the differential is really an adenocarcinoma. So here's a mesothelial marker named calretinin. This is positive both in the nuclei and cytoplasm of the tumor cells. So mesothelial, one mesothelial marker positive. Next, please. Next slide, please. The, um, you know, the common mesothelial marker that we use in addition to this is called WT1. 
And that's a nuclear marker. And you can see that it's beautifully positive in these neoplastic cells. So two mesothelial markers are positive. Next one. And then there's a cytoplasmic marker called cytokeratin 5 slash 6, which is also characteristically a mesothelial marker. So there's very, very strong evidence here that these are actually mesothelial cells. And combined with the morphologic interpretation that these are infiltrative, this makes it uh, very strong evidence for mesothelioma. Now, next, uh, please. We do try to um, also look at the alternative. So is there any evidence for carcinoma? So here's a marker of lung adenocarcinoma's TTF1, and that is uh, negative. Next, please. And here's a broad spectrum marker of carcinomas from many organs, including from the lung, which is called uh, carcinoembryonic antigen or CEA, and that's negative. So we have no evidence that this is a carcinoma and very strong evidence that this is mesothelioma. Next, please. Nowadays, a new marker that emerged is the so-called BAP1. And the BAP1 is um, helpful only when it is lost. So here, for example, in this case, the nuclear expression of BAP1 is retained. So that's not very helpful because um, loss of expression is only seen in about half of mesotheliomas. So um, if it is lost, it's very helpful because it's very specific. It's not, loss is not seen in benign lesions. But uh, um, retention of expression is not that helpful, as in this case. Next, please. So the diagnosis based on the biopsy was uh, malignant mesothelioma, epithelioid type, since the uh, uh, neoplastic cells are epithelial in appearance. Subsequent to this, next slide. We also received pleural fluid cytology, which also showed uh, similar cells as those seen in the biopsy, which was read as consistent with mesothelioma. Of course, as you know, uh, in fluids, the diagnosis is very, very difficult because you don't see infiltration. Uh, but based on the pri primarily on the pre existing biopsy diagnosis, this was read as consistent uh, with mesothelioma. And that's it for me. Thank uh, you so much. Any questions, Amreen? Anything I can uh, address? Uh, no, thank you so much, Dr. Makapadi. Um, thank you. Thanks a lot. That was very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. So sort of moving on, so uh, she, she gets this diagnosis of uh, primary pericardial mesothelioma, um, and sort of we go back and uh, start talking to the team, so we get speak to the cardiac and thoracic surgery team and our oncology team here. Um, and the first thing we want to talk about is whether there's any possibility of surgical resection, um, and, and that's deemed impossible given the extent of tumor and the encasement of the great vessels that it's impossible to go in. So we speak to oncology and, and they start the patient on a chemotherapy regimen with carboplatin and pemetrexid. Um, and with the understanding that, uh, that the, the, the outcomes for this tumor are not great to begin with and especially without any degree of surgical resection or, or debulking, the chemo can only do so much. Um, since then, uh, Actually, before we move on, um, Dr. Stevenson, do I have you on the line? Maybe, uh, I, I don't think. So we'll just go on. Um, so unfortunately, since then, she's had uh, repeated admissions with the compensated heart failure um, as the mass has not responded favorably to chemotherapy. And recently, she's been starting a palliative uh, radiotherapy for symptom control. So sort of talking a little bit, just take a few minutes and talk about it, but this is a repeat echocardiogram from uh, just very recently, and this is after a couple of cycles of chemo, and, and um, basically we don't see a whole lot of difference. We kind of still see the mass around the heart. Um, and in this view, maybe you could argue that it's less nodular or less irregular, but overall there's not been much difference, and she's continued to do, uh, unfortunately, rather poorly. So just talking about primary pericardial mesothelioma. Uh, so again, an exceedingly rare but lethal primary tumor of the pericardium. It's less than 1% of all mesotheliomas. Nevertheless, 50% of the primary pericardial tumors, um, because most of the pericardial tumors are actually secondary tumors and not primary. So of the few that are primary, it, it, it takes a big chunk, but overall exceedingly rare. Um, there were 103 published cases in the last sort of 20 this is, uh, years or so, but in total there have been about 150 cases and that, that's about it. Um, median, median age diagnosis of 55 years, a survival of less than six months. Um, and asbestos exposure is hypothesized, is sort of associated with pleural and peritoneal mesothelioma, so it's also hypothesized to increase risk. We went back and asked the lady, she's had no um, sort of history of asbestos exposure. 
And sort of treatment, so the three uh, or two real modalities, whether you can resect the mass or not, whether uh, you use, can use chemo or not, and whether you do both of these with, with or without radiation. And basically the only thing shown to sort of have a, a modest survival benefit was the chemotherapy. Um, and the surgery, it's not really worked because I think of these 150, maybe uh, only two or three cases actually underwent complete resection. This was in younger people. Everybody else, by the time the tumors identified, the tumors sort of invaded structures around the great vessels or something, and only partial pericardectomy can be performed. And so it's more with the palliative intent or with, with the intent of just debulking the tumor. So, so I don't know if that's a fair comparison, but... Yeah, for now at least we don't think surgery's done much. The data is very sparse um, because of the very, very few cases, but the suggestion is to use combination carboplatin and pemetrexid therapy. Um, 35 patients were sort of reviewed in this paper um, uh, who received combination chemotherapy and uh, had some survival benefit um, on uh, with this. Gemcetabine, which was used previously, is not associated with survival benefit, and the true prognostic factors were metastasis was worse and chemotherapy with a little bit of survival benefit. Surgery, which was mostly partial, uh, pericardectomy and radiotherapy did not impact survival. So sort of when, when I look at this case, I, I, the question that I ask myself is, was this a missed opportunity for diagnosis uh, the first two times that she presented? And sort of looking into the literature for this, it's kind of uh, variable. This, this kind of tumor can mimic signs of constructive pericarditis, recurrent effusions until a much later stage when it organizes into tumor form, so it's hard to pick it up on imaging early, which, is the case, which was the case here. Um, and the false negative rates of pericardial fluid cytology and pericardial biopsy in all tumors um, uh, with malignant pericardial effusions have been sort of variable. So it can be with the cytology uh, false negative up to 15% and with the biopsy up to 40, 45%, um, uh, which is pretty high. Um, the sensitivity of cytology is that diagnosing malignancy is very high when you do have it. Um, but um, in her, both the, both the prior times, we had cytology, which was negative, and a pericardial biopsy, which was negative. So it's very unfortunate. And sort of looking through the literature, there's been multiple cases like this where people have presented late with the mass, and then earlier on, sort of looking back, there was no evidence of it on, on diagnostic studies. Um, so sort of before I end, just sort of talking a little bit about cardiac masses. This is about intra and extra cardiac masses both, but basically judging the mass by the company it keeps in guilt by association. So suspicious characteristics for any mass that you see would be broad-based attachment, loss of tissue planes, traversing the cardiac chambers, pericardial involvement, and tissue heterogeneity. Um, and here, except for traversing the cardiac chambers, um, we had everything um, in this mass. And sort of MRI being the, the, the gold standard for sort of uh, t uh, getting some characteristics of the mass. Um, so sort of looking through, and I won't sort of label this, but the a couple of things here would be um, the delayed gadolinium enhancement is pretty high with malignant tumors. However, this one, we did not have uh, a lot of late gadolinium enhancement. Um, and, and that was uh, probably because it's not a very vascular tumor. Um, and uh, other than that, sort of the MR imaging characteristic of common cardiac masses, again, the lymphoma and mesothelioma are the ones with no and minimal uptake. So with... Yeah. Hey, uh, this is Hello? James Stevenson. I, uh, oh, are you able to hear thank me? you, Dr. Stevenson. Yes, yes, we can. Thank I you. I was having problems uh, unmuting myself, but uh, I'm happy to add a little commentary if, if still needed. Uh, no, absolutely. Thank you so much. Okay. So, so, so Jamie, um, can you comment on the uh, the treatment of this patient? Yeah. So, you know, as you heard. You know the the main uh, the mainstay of treatment for you know all mesotheliomas, uh, the, uh, which you know aren't surgical candidates of which, uh, you know really the um, plural mesotheliomas are the kind of the paradigm that is uh, you know given the most common type of mesothelioma that that tends to be followed and this is where we get all of our kind of clinical trials data from our, our really uh, plural mesothelioma patients and really very. Only about 10% or less of plural mesothelioma patients are even considered for surgical resection. So, mesothelioma, as in the case with pericardial mesos, uh, is, is really not a surgical disease, um, except in, you know, peritoneal mesos are a bit uh, different in that we, you know, surgery is more of a mainstay of treatment for them. So, it, it wasn't um, uh, uncommon that 
for this woman not to be a surgical candidate because, you know, really only in the case of a more localized pericardial meso would surgical resection probably add benefit. Again, these are, you know, the, the data that we have to go on are from case series or, you know, reviews where, you know, the largest review was just over 100 patients published a few years ago. Uh, and I, I don't even think in terms of the number of pericardial patients that I've seen, you know, in just over 20 years of seeing thoracic oncology, it's I don't even know that it's in double digits. So these are very rare. And um, I, in terms of responsiveness to systemic therapy, it, it does appear that, you know, as uh, Dr. Ali uh, mentioned, that you know there, there there can be some survival improvement with uh, chemotherapy. Um, she also had, uh, before her most recent admission, had been on immunotherapy, which is a relatively new. Uh, uh, treatment for mesothelioma that, again, with plural mesothelioma, we had evidence of a survival benefit in, in a randomized trial. But again, unfortunately, in her case, she really did not respond to either uh, chemotherapy or immunotherapy. She had no radiographic improvement and, and had clinical deterioration throughout the course of both of these treatments. And uh, she uh, just recently started uh, radiotherapy, which is technically difficult. Um, and again, our, our thoracic uh, radiation oncologist, this was, you know, given the, the rarity of these cases, this is something that they really had to plan carefully. And uh, that's where she is right now in her treatment course. Again, these are difficult cases. Um, and especially, uh, obviously, with the pericardial, pericardium being involved, it, there's just not as much um, room for the, these tumors to uh, to grow as opposed to the pleura, where we obviously we have two lungs or the abdomen where there's, you know, the compartment is is a little bit different. So that, that's why, you know, her um, her clinical course has been so complicated with, you know, admissions and and uh, symptoms. And it's it's just been a very difficult case for this poor woman. Okay, that's great. Uh, thanks, Jamie. Um, may yeah. I ask the panel uh, very briefly? Um, uh, we have Dr. Jealous. Um, uh, and, and Dr. Kwan, Wilson Tang, uh, any uh, comments, uh, Christine? Uh, Firstly, just thank you for sharing that case because I think as we've heard that is such a, a rare condition and many of us will see very few of these in our lifetime. So I think being able to recognize the characteristics is really important. Um, I won't labor the point, but I think you showed nicely on the multimodality imaging how we can use that for tissue characterization to really tease out how much of that is soft tissue mass versus um, fluid? Is the fluid organized? Is it not organized? Is there tethering? All those sorts of things. And I think you showed with um, the MRI in particular that you can really come to a, a fairly ro robust conclusion of what you're dealing with before you have the tissue sample. Obviously, we want to confirm the pathology, um, but I think just all these modalities are so complementary and, and obviously the extent of disease and the spread and those characteristics that would tease out benign versus malignant and so forth. So thank you for sharing. It was a great case. Thank you. Uh, Debbie, uh, any, any comments? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, just want to echo the same comments. Phenomenal uh, presentation and case. Yeah. The pet actually was the one that struck me the most. <laughs> As you said, lit up like a sun. I mean, I'm a huge proponent of MRI, uh, but I think the pet was really the most striking because I think with MRI we can often tell you, yeah, we think it's, malignant and or we think it's benign, but the PET really helps to definitively say um, that. And also with MRI, while we have those good, you know, table of characteristics, we can't really definitively tell you what the uh, final diagnosis is. Mm -hmm. So again, I, I think this was a nice uh, case showing how imaging helped to bring it to, you know, this is malignant, but the tissue diagnosis was, was absolutely necessary. But thank you for uh, showing such a great case. Thank you. Dr. Tang from Heart Failure. Uh, she's on um, Torstamide 100 BIT currently. Uh, yeah, I, I think, I think uh, contrary to most people, actually heart failure docs always like to think about how can we not encounter this scenario. So I actually kept on thinking as you're presenting, should we have uh, a lot more vigilance early on? Uh, you did tap some blood, I remember yeah, when you yeah, come out, and, and uh, <laughs> that got me to think all the persistent uh, uh, pericardial effusion cases 
you know, uh, whether multimodality imaging has some bearing to have an earlier diagnosis before the, the heart get in case. I mean, obviously, this is some, some opportunity that we need to think about as we kind of put some of these malignancies as uh, uh, in a differential as we work up these cases. Uh, the only comment I would make is that <clears throat> the patient uh, presented with uh, typical constriction with a very, very unusual cause. So, uh, you know, we were, um, I think we did a handheld echo as well, and uh, we were struck by uh, some of the findings and that uh, that to some of the investigation, but it had all the features of the constriction, but not the, uh, not the most common cause of this. And unfortunate, um, a lady's going through all this uh, heart failure. But uh, Dr. Allen, that was an excellent case. Uh, that's uh, worthy of uh, publication yeah. and as well. well. Well, thank you very much. Thank you.